Hello, everyone. So many wonderful, familiar faces here today. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's program, Karen Higa, Reverberations. Before we begin, I want to thank our co-presenters at the AAPI Arts Network for organizing this event. The Hammer is totally thrilled to partner with them today, and we hope there will be many, many, many more programs with them in the future. Karen Higa was such an utterly brilliant person. I feel very privileged to have met her and spoken with her many times before she died at the absurdly young age of 47 in 2013. I was a total fangirl and I was always super thrilled when I had a chance to talk to her. Not only was she always the smartest person in the room, but she was kind, funny, warm, generous, and all around amazing. Her partner, Russell Ferguson, was the chief curator at the Hammer Museum for a long time before going on to lead the UCLA Department of Art and will always be indebted and very grateful for the huge amount of creative energy and time they've both given to this museum and to UCLA. I was very happy to hear that the scholar Julie Alt put together a book of Karen Higa's writings called Hidden in Plain Sight, Selected Writings of Karen Higa. The book was just released and we have copies here. There's some in the back of the room that you can look at and we'll have them available for purchase um, at the reception following today's panel. The new book formed the inspiration for today's program in which we'll have an opportunity to explore the significant contributions to the art historical canon that Karen made through her work as a scholar and a curator and also to talk about her ongoing legacy as a thought leader and a mentor to many artists and scholars in the field. So today's program will start with a few words from artist Patty Chang of the AAPI Arts Network, and then an introduction by Dr. Karen Ishizuka, the chief curator of the Japanese American National Museum, and then a panel discussion with Sonia Mack, Mika Yoshitaki, Anna Su Hoi, and Kelly Akashi. And after the panel, you're all invited to a reception in the Hammer Courtyard right outside the door immediately following the program. So now please join me in giving a warm welcome to artist Patty Chang of the AAPI the Arts Network. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Claudia and Shannon and the Hammer Museum for partnering with the Asian American Pacific Islander Arts Network on this program. And thank you so much for all of you who are coming here today. It's such a special program for us. Um, <clears throat> we acknowledge the vital role postdocs and graduate student workers play in the functioning of the University of California system and support their demands for a living wage and fair labor practices. The organizing committee of this program consulted with striking workers as well as union organizers to ensure we respected strike sanctions. We are very much in solidarity with the historic strike by UC academic workers. I'm Patty Chang and I'm a member of the Asian American Pacific Islander Arts Network, an emergent network of self-identified AAPI visual artists, curators, educators, writers, and patrons working to build open relational platforms to give agency to the rich complexity of the AAPI experience through the collective exploration and sharing of contemporary AAPI arts practices. Formed in response to the recent and recurrent rise in anti-Asian bigotry and violence, during the uh, pandemic, AAPI Arts Network seeks to present present these art practices in dialogue with past, present, and future socio-political contexts with their overarching goals of increasing visibility for the experiences and works of AAPI cultural producers and catalyzing a more sustainable, equitable, and just national discourse in what it means to be Asian American Pacific Islander. From our earliest conversations as a group, um, Karen Higa's name was often evoked as someone who many looked up to as a cultural leader, a fearless scholar, curator, writer, and thinker, and a generous advocate for artists, artists, and communities that she embraced. My own memories of her are as a person of kindness, clarity, and grace. Her legacy seems so vital to amplify in 2022. This panel was organized to remind us of her legacy and to introduce her work to younger generations in tandem with the publication of her collected book of writings, Hidden in Plain Sight, Selected Writings, of Karen Higa, edited by Julie Alt and Dancing Foxes Press. The close attention of her observations and writings, the care to artists, communities, and histories gives us a model to how to be in the world. 
We wanted to extend our deepest gratitude to Barbara Schroeder and Karen Kelly at Dancing Foxes, as well as Julie Alt, whose time and energy was instrumental in making this happen, and acknowledge the work of the committee members who uh, worked putting this event together, Chris Kurumitsu, Anna Sue Hoy, Ana Iwataki, George Yin, and Sue Kim. And there are many to thank for their support for this event, including major support from Deborah Ermas and the Audrey and Sydney Ermas Charitable Foundation, Netflix and Christopher Yin, Susan Song, Sansa, and numerous additional individual donors. Uh, and above all, we'd also like to extend our thanks to, the, to Karen Higa's family, especially Kevin Higa, Rose Keiko Higa, and Russell Ferguson for all of their support. Um, today, we're honored to have Karen Ishizuka with us to say a few words about Karen. Karen Ishizuka is chief curator of the Japanese American National Museum and scholar of Japanese American history and culture. Her works, including the incredible books, Serve the People, Making Asian America in the 60s from 2016, which is a pen America's list of recommended books, Lost and Found, Reclaiming the Japanese American Incarceration from 2006, about the making of the exhibition America's Concentration Camps, and her film, Toyo Miyataki, Infinite Shades of Grey from 2002, which was an official selection at the Sundance Film Festival. After the introduction, Sonia Mack will open the panel discussion and introduce her fellow panelists. The panelists will speak briefly and then converse with each other before we open at the end to questions from the audience. A mic will be passed around at this time. Sonia Mack is first generation Chinese American and Los Angeles based curator and arts administrator. She was the founding curator of the Chinese American Museum. She co-founded and co-curated Art Salon Chinatown, a showcase for Asian American artists established in 2018. Her curatorial work is focused on Chinese American and Asian Amer American art. Ms. Mack's exhibition and catalog pro project, Round the Clock, Chinese American Artists Working in Los Angeles, was presented as part of the Getty Foundation's first unprecedented regional initiative, Pacific Standard Time, Art in LA, 1945 to 1980. And please, if you can help me welcome um, Karen Ishizuka. Thanks. Thank you, Patty. Uh, and thank you to Chris Kuramitsu for inviting me here, and Claudia um, as well for hosting it here. Um, you know, first of all, I want to pay my respects and acknowledge um, Karen's family. Uh, her husband, Russell Ferguson, um, her mother, Keiko, her late father, Kaz, uh, her brother, Kev Kevin, and her niece, Rose Keiko, of whom Karen would be so proud. And thank you, Russell and Kevin, for giving me your blessings to introduce Karen today. You know, I first met Karen when she was 11. Um, and for those who, of you who knew her, how many people here knew her? Ah, so you can just imagine Karen Higa at 11, right? Um, it probably isn't too much from the version of her that you knew. Um, one of the th first things she, this preteen asked me when I first met her was how I felt about the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. <laughs> so that was my introduction to Karen, precocious always beyond her years. I met Karen through my husband, Bob Nakamura, who was a close friend of Karen's father, Kaz. They had been friends since high school and bonded throughout their lives through art. Karen wrote about Bob's photography of early black artists for the Now Dig This uh, exhibit here at the Hammer. Cos was the best man at our wedding. Cos was the best man at Bob's first wedding. <laughs> we got married in their backyard. Uh, Karen, who was then 12, um, and Kevin, who was probably 10, uh, made their backyard in Culver City into an art installation with giant paper tsudu that they made and hung from the trees. Another e experience that bonds me to Karen was that she was present at the birth of my son, Tad Nakamura. I had planned a home birth, and Tad was due around my daughter Ty's sixth birthday, so I couldn't not have a birthday party for her. So Kaz, Keiko, Karen, and Kevin were there at the house for a small birthday celebration 
And when it came apparent that Tad was going to crash the party, uh, the women accompanied me to the bedroom. So at age 14, Karen was eyewitness to the miracle of birth. Now, I've had two kids, um, but it wasn't until I was, in a, I was able to accompany a midwife friend of mine uh, to a birth that I really realized what a miracle that was. So in reflecting on Karen's life, I think two reasons she was able to become the fireball that she was to accomplish so much in her relatively short life were, one, she had many extraordinary early life experiences and opportunities, and two, more importantly, she had the wherewithal to incorporate them into the nucleus of who she was. Her parents were her first role models and enablers. Kaz was an influential teacher at Los Angeles City College. When Karen and Kevin were young, he was also the director of their art gallery. So when he mounted a show and worked late, Keiko would pack dinner and schlep the kids to the gallery where Kaz pressed them all into doing whatever they could to help. And of course, they attended every opening. So at a very early age, Karen was exposed to and obviously sponged up what it takes to mount an exhibition. When she was 10, Kaz and Keiko took Karen and Kevin out of school to accompany Kaz on a research trip to Hawaii, Okinawa, and Japan for two months, another sponge opportunity. Jumping to another slide, one evening over dinner, at their house, Karen made the announcement that she was going to be a Renaissance woman. You can see they're doing that too, right? Which basically revealed her desire and drive to do and be everything. In high school, Karen not only excelled in academics, she was a cheerleader, student body president, wrote for the school newspaper, and was on the forensics team. Strategically, she chose the category of impromptu, where they got the topic some 15 minutes before debating, because then she figured out she wouldn't have to spend so much time preparing. So all of you who had ever lost an argument to Karen, you never had a chance. <laughs> she was practicing since the moment, for that moment, she was 15, from when she was 15. Other sponge opportunities. During the summer between her junior and senior year of high school, she went to college for summer school, Harvard at that, after which she went to Egypt, which was an opportunity enough, but she went with a friend whose family was connected to the embassy. So Karen had the experience of going to state dinners and was overall exposed to the world of international di diplomacy. A year later, she was in the first co-ed class at Columbia. I was initially going to say that she didn't go with the intention of breaking a 200-year tradition, but on second thought, maybe she did. When she graduated, Bob and I were working for the Japanese American National Museum. Uh, one day at a staff meeting, we were discussing who could curate our upcoming exhibition on camp art. And Bob actually suggested Kaz, uh, Karen's father. Uh, Kaz ended up declining. And although she was young and inexperienced, Bob and I suggested who we thought was the next best thing, Kaz's daughter, Karen. At that time, Karen was in the Independent Studies Program and Curatorial Studies at the Whitney. After discussing a few other options, Janum decided to give this young, inexperienced version of Karen a try. The rest, as they say, is history. And I have to credit the late Irene Hirano, who was the CEO of Janum at the time, for listening to us and believing in our belief that Karen could do it. And I'm also just a firm believer in providing young, inexperienced people with bold chances and opportunities. And thank goodness, Karen proved us right. The View from Within was the first of 10 or so exhibitions that she created for the museum over her 15 year tenure. You know, and at this point, I'd like to take a moment and share a story as it provides so much insight into Karen's tenacity and brilliance. One of the artists she was interested 
in for the camp art exhibit was Hideo Kobashigawa, who at that time was a recluse living in Brooklyn. Karen found out where he lived and wrote to him that she would like to visit him on a particular date. She didn't hear back from him, but she went to his place at the designated time anyway. She knocked on his door. No one answered, but she could hear that someone was, was inside. Through the closed door, she shouted an introduction, saying she was interested in his art. Still no response. Now this is where the tenacity and brilliance of Karen comes in. Karen knew that Kobashigawa was an Okinawan name. And on a hunch, she decided to play the Okinawan card, as she was also Okinawan. You should know that Okinawans are a very tight group. Okinawa is a prefecture of Japan, but it was originally an independent country with their own language, their own culture, their own art, which was conquered and colonized by Japan. During World War II, they were almost obliterated by both the US and Japan and salt in the wound. They were also very much discriminated against by Naichi, mainland Japanese, uh, including Japanese Americans. So as a result, they are very close knit. So Karen knew Kobashigao was Okinawan, and so she told him that she also was Okinawan. He said something like, prove it. So Karen wrote Higa in kanji on a slip of paper and slid it under the door. I think Higa was the only thing she actually knew how to write in kanji. <laughs> um, and eventually, uh, click, 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 he unlocked the many locks on his housing project door. And Karen found out later that she was one of the only people he had ever allowed into his home. You know, synchronistically, I was just at Janum and happened to go through some of Hideo Kobashigawa's work uh, just last Friday. And I was struck that almost every piece of art that he donated was inscribed to Karen. For me, among the greatest of her many accomplishments and contributions was finding Hideo Kobashigawa. Even though he is still not recognized by the art world, he didn't care about that. What was far more important was that after years of being alone and himself feeling alone, if not for Karen, he would never have had the inner satisfaction of feeling seen, understood, and appreciated which is what I think we all wish for. A lot has been discussed, debated, pontificated about the role of artists in society, of giving form to the ineffable, of, interpret of interpreting their times, yet in many cases it is often silent, the silent partner of the art historian and curator, like Karen, like her father Cause, and like so many of you here today, that brings art to we, the people. And so on behalf of the Japanese American National Museum, as well as myself, I'd like to extend much gratitude to Karen for bringing light to Asian American artists and Asian American art as a discipline, to Russell, Keiko, Kevin, and Rose Keiko for being the wind beneath her wings, and to all of you who are carrying on her legacy, but more importantly than her own legacy for continuing the work that she prized so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. And thank you to the Hammer Museum and the Asian American Pacific Islander Arts Network for inviting us to participate in this panel. My name is Sonia Mack, and I'd like to introduce the panelists that we'll be hearing from today. Kelly Akashi, 
On your left is a multidisciplinary artist based in Los Angeles. She initially trained in analog photography, and her interest in the photographic process of transformation through time and space moved her to explore candle making, sculpture, and glass making. In sculptures and installations that emphasize the reciprocity of touch, she forges experimental dynamic objects that recall states of organic transformation, growth, and decay. Her work is included in the permanent collections here at the Hammer Museum, at LACMA, Sifang Museum in China, among others. She has had solo exhibitions at the Aspen Art Museum, the Headlands Center for the Arts, the Carolyn Glasgow Bailey Foundation, Arch Athens, and at the Sculpture Center in New York. She also teaches at Art Center College of Design. To her right is Anna Su Hoi. She is also a multidisciplinary artist who uses sculpture, ceramics, public art, and performance to connect with our environment and to demonstrate the power found in the fleeting and the handmade. Her work has been at the forefront of a re-engagement with clay in contemporary art and is identified with a critical rethinking of the relationship between art and craft. Sue Hoy's work is in the collections of the Hammer Museum, LACMA, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego. Solo presentations of her work have been mounted here at the Hammer, at MOCA, the Aspen Art Museum, the, um, the San Jose Museum of Art, and at the Orange County Museum of Art. She was awarded a Creative Capital Grant for Visual Art and a Guggenheim Fellowship for Visual Art. She has also received the California Community Foundation Grant for Emerging Artists, the United States Artists Broad Fellowship, and the Anonymous Was a Woman Award. She is a professor here at UCLA. And lastly, to my right, is Mika Yoshitake. She is an independent curator with expertise in post-war Japanese art. Her first major exhibition and catalog was the AICA USA award-winning Requiem for the Sun, the Art of Monoha at Blum and Poe in 2012, introducing the late 1960s Japanese art movement, Monoha, into an international context. She has recently curated Yoshitomo Nara, an international retrospective originating at LACMA in 2020, Kusama, Cosmic Nature, at New York Botanical Garden in 2021, and is co-curator of Yayoi Kusama, 1945, till now, currently on view at M Plus Hong Kong. She was previously a curator at the Smithsonian's Hirshhorn Museum, where she organized Yayoi Kusama Infinity Mirrors, a six-venue North American tour, among numerous other exhibitions. She is currently co-curating an exhibition with Glenn Kaino entitled Breathe Towards Climate and Social Justice here at the Hammer Museum in 2024. Please join me in welcoming the panelists. And we're gonna start off our conversation today um, first with Mika, then I will follow, then Anna, and then Kelly, and then we'll go into discussion. Okay, Mika, please take it away. Thank you, Sonia, and thank you so much for having me here in such amazing company. Um, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to reflect on Karen and Karen's life. Um, I first met Karen in 1999, um, a year before completing my undergraduate studies at Berkeley. Um, I was applying for the Getty Multicultural Internship um, Program, and I remember, um, her very sharp demeanor and pointed questions during the interview. Um, while I ended up working as a curatorial intern at the Japanese Pavilion at LACMA, um, due to my interest in modern and contemporary Japanese art, um, as opposed to Japanese American art, I was intrigued by Karen's critical writing, which emerged out of the 1990s multicultural identity politics era and in the unearthing of the hidden histories of Japanese American incarceration. Her 1996 art journal essay, Some Thoughts on National and Cultural Identity, Art by Contemporary Japanese American Artists, which, was, um, which included the then US-based Japanese artist Yukinori Yanagi, was the subject of my undergraduate thesis and was a 
key early cornerstone in my research at the time. As a bilingual Nisei, a second generation Japanese American, um, to Japanese born parents who moved to the US in the 1950s and 60s, I grew up amongst both native Japanese and Japanese American communities. Most Niseis were much older, having immigrated to the US before the war. So there are only a handful from my generation, a point I remember discussing with Karen. My father established Shogun Tours, a travel agency in Little Tokyo, in Weller Court on Onizuka Street in 1973, and was an active part of the community until his death in 1985. My mother was an artist who came to the US in 1967 to study with Mike Kanemitsu, the late abstract painter, um, Kibe Nise, or um, an American-born, raised in Japan and returning to the US, who was active in New York during the 1950s, played an instrumental role in introducing Gutai and Kusama to New York galleries, and then moved to LA to teach at Schwinnard and Cal Arts in the 1970s. Kanemitsu's studio was on 800 Traction Avenue in Little Tokyo. I have formative memories of attending openings and gathering, gatherings as a kid at Kanemitsu's studio, which was right next door to artist Bruce Yonemoto. I didn't meet Bruce until later, but first saw his work in Karen's uh, Bruce and Norman Yonemoto Memory, Matter, Matter and Modern Romance in 1999 at Janem. The exhibition was incredibly memorable and awakened me to the radicality of video and film as critical mediums to address how deep-rooted racial stereotypes and cultural conventions resonated in popular culture. As Karen stated in her essays, essay, the Yonemoros could reference ethnic difference without foregrounding the search for ethnic identity. In fact, the show inspired me to learn more about the history of the experimental medium, which lent itself to more acute and criti creative critiques of ethnic and national reality and representation than traditional plastic media. It led me to apply for a year-long curatorial internship at MoMA under legendary video art curator Barbara London in New York, and eventually um, study contemporary art history as a, with a specialization in, in, on Japan in graduate school at UCLA. I soon re-met Karen through her husband, Russell, Russell Ferguson, um, who, through my graduate, graduate advisor at the time, uh, Miwan Kwan. Um, and I would see them at openings, events, New Year's Eve celebrations. They were great mentors who helped me navigate the relational methodological framework um, during my research at the time, how to frame post-war Japanese art in relation to the global versus the multicultural rather than being siloed as a national history, and to work through the largely Eurocentric modernist trajectory of contemporary art history and the nascent field of transnational art history. Karen's work has inspired me to think about cultural bias, translation, the reception and circulation of Japan as a, a, cultural, as a cultural construct in the US, and yet, I've also had to confront the intra-racial conflict of Japan's surprising disinterest and bias against Japanese Americans as a byproduct of US colonialism. In fact, this bias has even trickled into my personal career with regards to the Japanese reception of my curatorial work. That is, discrimination from senior Japanese curators and critics of an older generation who have positioned my work of introducing post-war Japanese art in the US as an extension of American cultural colonialism. On the other hand, here in the US, I have faced resistance from contemporary Asian specialists in the US who have claimed this territory because of a scarcity in expertise. While we didn't get a chance to discuss these issues specifically, Karen's understanding and support throughout my years in graduate school and in my per per professional life resonate deeply. Always one to come to first to come to my openings, book signings, suggesting me for talks. Russell as well referred to me, referred me to a curatorial position at the Hirschhorn Museum where I worked from 2011 to 2018. And in 2013, Karen recommended me as an inaugural lecturer at the San Jose State University where I spoke just a few months after her death and dedicated the talk to her. 
The last time I saw Karen was in the East Room of the White House on June 3rd, 2013, for an event organized by the White House Historical Association in celebration of American art. I was standing in line behind her, Russell, and Catherine Opie to say hello to the First Lady, Michelle Obama, who had invited her along with many artists and curators. Despite being physically weak and needing to sit, she looked so chic and her intensity was magnetic as ever. I will always remember or wonder what our conversations would be like today if Karen were here. She's been an inspiration, both personally and professionally, at key moments throughout my life. And this new book of writings will reflect how vast her research was and will continue to inspire and touch the careers of future generations, just as she did mine. Thanks. Thank you, Mika. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit off the cuff. I just have some notes here. Um, I was very fortunate to meet Karen and to work with Karen in my career as a curator. I first met her in 2001 when just a few weeks out of graduate school, a master's degree. Um, I started working at the Chinese American Museum as an assistant curator, and there were three of us in total, three staffers, not three curators. <laughs> three staff. <laughs> and the museum hadn't even opened yet. Um, we didn't have the money to open it yet. Um, and so inadvertently, I became a founding curator there, um, which I'm very proud of. I mean, I chose the letters that want, that, that are still on the outside of the building. Um, and I'm, I find remarkable how many, although Karen and I had very different lives and very different um, <sighs> roots, um, how much we have in common. Um, that, that exhibition, The View From Within, was a project she took on at 25. And when I started at the Chinese American Museum, I was also 25 years old. Um, and um, the board took a chance on me. They had reservations about the fact that my degree was in art history and not Asian American studies or Asian American history. Um, like the Japanese American National Museum, the Chinese American Museum is a cultural history museum, and the arts are really marginalized there. But some of the first people that I met were Tyrus Wong, at the, very, at the young, sprightly age of 90, um, May Sun, who was the first Asian American artist I ever wrote a research paper about, um, and Karen Higa. Who, um, whose essay I had read back in 1995 when I first started going to school at San Francisco State. Um, and I'll get back to college in a little bit, but you know, when I was working at the Chinese American Museum, Janum, I mean, we just wanted to be Janum. <laughs> They had this big, shiny, beautiful building, and they really, they were able to mobilize a national community in such effective and powerful way. Um, and we just wanted to be just like them. But we weren't a national museum. We were, a, you know, a local community grassroots museum. So we were very fundamentally different in a lot of ways. But Karen was still a role, role model of mine. And as a little baby curator, um, um, she, she was so accepting and so welcoming. Um, and she never made me feel less than. Um, and I just wanted to be like her when I grew up. And I still do. <laughs> um, the, the, so, you know, I was, I was at the Chinese American Museum from 2001, um, over 20 years ago, um, till 2007, and I helped to open that museum. And uh, I was able to work um, in, a, in a very regular, consistent way with the Japanese American National Museum because my first project there was called Finding Family Stories. And it was a three-year partnership where every three weeks we were meeting with Janum 
we are meeting with the curatorial team at JANUM, the California African American Museum, and Self Help Graphics every three weeks for three years. <laughs> so I'm still friends with all those people that I worked with. Um, and that's how I became friends with Karen. But there was also a very special experience in 2012 that um, I'm so glad that I got to experience with Karen, and that was the National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Institute. Um, and it was like art history summer camp for three weeks at NYU, and we all got to stay in the dorms, and we made a lot of noise, and the RAs had to come tell us to keep it down, because the students were sleeping. <laughs> um, and that was me and Karen and 30 other um, um, curators and academics and scholars from all over the US and some international. And the theme of that summer institute was called Re-Envisioning Asian American Art History. And, um, I can tell you it was a really wonderful, rewarding experience. My best friend said, you should go to graduate school because I've never seen you so happy as you were those three weeks. It was a very special time and Karen actually, um, we all took a, a visit to the Noguchi Museum, which I'd never been to before, and she offered a lecture on the research that she was doing about Noguchi, since she was one of the 18 scholars working on the Noguchi Digital Catalog Resume project. Um, and it was a very special time, and we, I felt very lucky. There were three things that I wanted to tell, um, that I wanted to share, all of, share with all of you about my experience with Karen. And those are acceptance, community, and accessibility. Those are things that she taught me in my experience working with her. She accepted me, um, a first-generation college student from a working-class immigrant family, um, fully and completely. I've always felt out of place in the arts um, because of my background, and I always sought out role models because my parents couldn't provide a roadmap for me. I don't have a safety net. I won't inherit anything. All I have is what I make and um, the people who I choose as guides in this field. And she was one of them. I took one family vacation. My family only took one vacation and we went to San Francisco and Yosemite and that was how I chose my college. I went to San Francisco State University and although that's not the best way to choose a college. I'm so glad that I went there because I learned that that was the birthplace of ethnic studies in the United States. And that's where I learned that um, the assimilation strategy that my parents um, told me I should take up was indeed wrong. Um, and I learned that my identity as an Asian woman is politicized. But I also found important mentors there like Marge Mark Johnson and Irene Poon Anderson, and in 1995, when I landed there, the gallery had With New Eyes, an exhibition about starting an Asian American art history, and that's where I first learned Karen's name, because she wrote an essay in that catalog. So all of this kind of folds back on one another. The reason why acceptance is an important lesson is Karen taught me that community takes all kinds. And people's lives and experiences are really the raw material taking place in the medium of time that form history. And I realized working with Karen that she was a really important ally because in the Asian American community, the arts is very marginalized. And in the arts community, Asian Americans are incredibly marginalized. So we're double marginalized. But there she was with me, right there in that middle. So I always had an ally and I never felt alone. And that's really powerful. It's incredibly powerful. She also taught me that a movement takes all kinds. 
all kinds of people, even someone like me, sitting on a stage with power women. <laughs> um, she taught me that the work that we're doing as curators and as activists and, act and advocates um, needs to keep needs to keep going. We need to be dedicated to it. It's important to commit ourselves to it. There's value in it, even if there aren't many of us doing the work. And I thought this morning about something that a board member at the Chinese American Museum used to say to us. He was, he was very much a bulldog, Munson Kwok. He would always have this dogged look on his face. <laughs> Um, he would say, may I remind you people, he said this at a construction meeting before the museum was even open, he said, may I remind you people, we are working here towards our own extermination. <laughs> it's always so fatalistic. Um, and that's because at the Chinese American Museum, he wanted to remind us that one day there wouldn't be a need for a Chinese American Museum. One day, there wouldn't be a need for a Japanese American National Museum, because someday, people in this country could look at a face like mine and understand that I belong here. And that's the power of those words. And it's those kinds of lessons that Karen helped to teach me by her working alongside me. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, so I just have um, a reel of images, but they're just going. Um, it's really wonderful to be here to remember Karen and think through her legacy. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm just going to start reading. Uh, in the early aughts, I was making work in my studio in the old women's building <clears throat> on North Spring, adjacent to where Lauren Bond was bringing attention to the brown site next door by creating not a cornfield. Chinatown was where most of the art shows took place, although Culver City galleries were popping up like wildfire. I was making abstract assemblage sculpture and was looking for models beyond the art history I learned in school. I turned to Scholar Rocks and Ikebana and found my way to Shintoism and then animism in general, where all things have a spiritual essence. I was finding life spirit in things around me, such as a beer can, cell phone charger, and tumbleweeds that collected at my freeway entrance to the 110. I was bringing my work outside to see what it looked like and also using it to connect with friends. I had Sapporo drinking parties where everyone drank their 22 ounce can and then I used the empties. There's something here about art, history, and social organizing which brings me to Karen Higa. For her, these were inseparable practices that formed a life's project. The little evidence I still have from that time includes the exhibition catalog for one way or another, Asian American Art Now, which Karen co-curated with Melissa Chu and Suzette Min, and also for Karen's beautiful show, Living Flowers. Karen brought my work to both of these exhibitions, and they were among my first institutional projects. If I were to generalize about the group of artists included in one way or another, I would say that we came up in the 90s during the era of identity-based art, and its subsequent backlash, and we had to create our own answers to how we would reflect back this world. In an 03 conversation with Eve Oishi, Patty Chang said of her performance video work, I'm always doing an Asian woman. There's irony and distance in this stance. In her catalog essay titled, The Last Asian American Exhibition in the Whole Entire World, Suzette Min wrote on my piece haiku, um, a two-toned yellowish gray and jade colored boulder made of polyurethane based foam sits anchored to a tinted mirror, the dimensions of which are slightly larger than the rock. 
Into the jade green boulder, Suhoi has inserted an array of knives, including steak knives and cleavers. The composition of the knives, the foam, and the mirror is a clever take on the strictures of haiku and possibly identity. The rock serves as a warning, perhaps, concerning the danger and impossibility of trying to discover a whole self. About a week after the opening at the Asia Society in New York, I got a call that there were security concerns about haiku, which was already installed in the galleries. I was asked, how well are the knives secured into the rock? The honest answer was that I merely bought the knives from the Chinese supermarket down the street in Echo Park, which has long been replaced by fancy restaurants, and I shoved them into the foam. This disconnect between institution and artist was due to the fact that the Asia Society was far more familiar with dealing in ancient carved stone from India or brush painting from the mountains of China. The makers of these treasures were long dead. I was flown to New York to superglue the knives into the foam in what felt like a theatrical performance. Um, Karen spoke of the way this traveling exhibition changed depending on the venue, from the Asia Society to the Blaffer Art Gallery in Houston to the Berkeley Art Museum and to the Japanese American Museum. Um, the different audiences saw the same exhibition with different eyes. Another thing that strikes me here is the fact that this show traveled to so many places across the country. I think it also went to Hawaii. One way or another in 06, it, in 06 was very much an answer, companion, and update to Margot Machida's 1994 show, Asia, America, Identities in Contemporary Asian American Art which was the first show of contemporary art ever at the Asia Society and focused on artists who were immigrants and their no negotiation of identity as expressed in the narrative of their art. One way or another came 12 years later. With it, Karen talked about picking up where Godzilla left off and described one way as taking a heterogeneous approach to artistic practice that defies the notion that there is a single Asian American art. Karen Higa's Living Flowers from 08, um, a show of contemporary art and Ikebana at the Japanese American Museum, demonstrates two parallel strategies of expression. Karen wrote that the art of flower arrangement was formed in direct relationship with painting and ceramics, as these were the three elements first brought together in the tokonoma hundreds of years ago, the hanging scroll, the vessel, and the flower arrangement. Here in this show, she flexes with her diverse references and floors us with how brilliantly she pulls from everywhere, yet is respectful and in command of all strands. Um, Part of the reel above uh, is an installation view of my piece, Why? Um, not this slide, but there's another, um, where it's sharing space with Noguchi's large square vase from 1952. Karen included me in the continuum of her enlightened American art history that saw flower arrangement as art that was an inclusive vision of art as interdisciplinary and practiced by associations of mutually supportive people. Um, and where are we now? Um, this question is answered again and again with successive exhibitions. Um, there is no last Asian American exhibition. Um, and so, uh, just to close, I just am talking now about the uprisings of 2020 um, amidst racial violence against black communities by police and amidst violence against Asian elders stoked by fear mongerers capitalizing on the COVID pandemic, um, we began meeting via Zoom. And this is the AAPIAN that Patty was talking about organizers and cultural workers, curators and writers and supporters of the arts banding together, going to one another's shows, working in common cause and in mutual support. 
The Karen Higa panels are our first public presentations as a collective. This is our way of searching for roots and finding a precursor, to quote the title of one of Karen's essays, which you can read in the new book. Um, Karen Higa was a peer, but she started so young and with so much sureness and determination that she's also a precursor. Um, out of this organizing work and inspired by Karen, I'm bringing together a group of 11 AAPI artists for an exhibition titled Scratching at the Moon. The show is graciously hosted by the ICALA, a very independent contemporary art museum in downtown, which all of you, many of you know. Um, the, sh the show is scheduled for 2024. Um, it highlights a community of serious thinkers whose contributions to culture are multiple through their pedagogical work in universities, through their own research, and through the example of their struggles to make and exhibit work. It historicizes important and undersung artists and their movements around the local yet sophisticated art world of Los Angeles from the over 20 years ago to the present. Those might be some of Sonia's words even because Sonia helped with <laughs> the grant writing towards this show. Um, and Patty Chang is included in this show and Bruce Yanamoto who spoke at the last panel is uh, also included in this show and um, nine other artists. Um, and uh, everyone is invited to the show in 24. <laughs> Thank you. It's already on, okay. Hi. Um, thank you to everyone on the panel for having me. Um, it's been really wonderful to learn so much about Karen Higa from her community, from her friends, family, um, from artists and historians. I did not know Karen Higa. I think I'm the only person on both panels who didn't know her. Um, so I've had a, uh, quite a task to now speak about somebody who I didn't know personally. Um, and I've been hoping that my place on this panel can uh, reflect the kind of impact that her life's work has had on future generations. Um, so for my part of this conversation, I'd like to share how I came to know her work and why this encounter has been important to me. Okay. <laughs> I'm an artist, and without getting into too much detail about my own practice, which I don't want to go on about, um, I want to say that part of my research is the activity of looking at objects from the past in order to read, to read the intentions and sensibilities of makers, to essentially learn from the people of the past through the objects they've left behind. And these kind of intergenerational conversations, even with people unknown to all of us now, is a driver of the work I make. And I even see myself and my work in relationship to future generations and think about what sensibilities I can register in my works that can be legible to future artists. Recently, I wanted to take this idea further, and during the pandemic, I started considering my own personal geology, my ancestry, and I began focusing on a known but somewhat hidden part of my family history, their time during the World War II internment of Japanese Americans. I used the word research earlier, and I want to clarify that part of what I'm talking about can't be fully researched since my father, who was interned as a child from the age of 8 to 10, is no longer alive. I don't have direct access to that time through him. And regardless, I don't think he would want to talk about it. It was both known and unknown. In order to try to understand something about this experience, which, which greatly shaped my father, and also try to understand something about how his experience may have shaped me, I visited the Japanese American National Museum and met with Rick, Rick Noguchi, who was part of the uh, part one of this conversation. My intention on this visit was to work with their archive. I wanted to find images of the trees during the time the camps were erected in their archive and compare them to the existing landscape to see if any of those trees were still existing. I had heard that the land was barren when the camps were erected and the internees were able to cultivate the land. So any trees still on that site, which, which is known as post and internment camp, are vestiges from the time of the camp. And during this visit and conversation with Rick, he told me about Karen, who I honestly had not known much about. 
I had developed an interest in wanting to know more about her work that from my perspective looks at and brings together artworks and artists that triangulate and open up a cross-cultural, intergenerational conversation that challenges fixed notions of artistic identity. You can't underestimate the value of this kind of encounter for any artist. This ongoing search, looking at objects, evidence of past voices, are parts of a foundation I am building to perpetuate into the future. And I found this in Karen's work as well. By attempting to find that which cannot be defined by creating this space, she has created the ability for future generations like mine to pick up and continue that work, complicating narratives that are applied to us that we do not need to passively accept. And I mean that broadly. I see her work as looking from within, from a specific cultural position, but is something that many other people can relate to from their own positions and identities. It is a struggle that so much of us share as artists and people. With that, I would like to share a passage from an essay she wrote that is titled California Registered Historical Landmark Number 850. I found this essay in Andrew Freeman's book, Manzanar Architecture Double, in which he photographs what were once barracks that had been removed from Manzanar, a World War II internment camp in California. They were relocated and repurposed. When I read this text, it really validated this somewhat speculative search that I was undertaking into my family's history and into my understanding of myself as an artist and as an individual tethered to a community that sometimes is connected through silence, especially around a specific history. In this essay, Karen recalls her family's trips to Manzanar, which was often organized around cleanups. She wrote, and it's in this uh, book, by the way, if um, that just came out. She wrote, we are all scavenging for history there, and we did it with our heads down, focused on the land, focusing on the land. There were no barracks, only piecemeal remains of concrete foundations, an occasional shard of thick white institutional pottery or bits of rusted metal. These fragments were evidence in our architectural search for truth. We knew that something had happened at Manzanar, and despite the absence of barracks, the traces on the ground gave credence to a history that was not part of official narratives of American history. We didn't learn about Japanese internment at school, we learned about it at home. And it seemed to me, as a child, a secret that, that Japanese American families kept among themselves. The trips we all took to Manzanar, a vast expanse of nothing, were proof of its elusiveness, as if the government had tried to sweep it all away. Giving material, giving substance to the two absence, finding the way to form that which is immaterial or, even, or has even been erased is a journey that led me to Karen's work. I've been overjoyed by the publication of this book, of her life's work, and with so much thanks to Julie Ault for her dedication and rigorous research so that it can continue to be encountered in perpetuity. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your contributions. Um, I, I don't know these panelists personally, really, so I'm, I'm meeting them for the first time, too, in a way. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for sharing. I have a couple of questions, and I hope you'll also share any questions that you have, too, as we have a bit of discussion here. Um, and this goes for Kelly, too, even though you didn't meet Karen. Um, how... How will Karen's influence continue to make a difference in your practice or inform your practice? I have a lot of reading to do. <laughs> Well, I, I, want, I do want to find out more about the work that you'd like to make, or you're still very much in the research stage. I think I'm coming in, I'm in the middle, you know, okay. there's a lot coming ahead. I'm trying to speak to that, that, I mean, Julie did such an amazing job. I understand these are not just essays that Karen written, but it's really her, her body of work. Um, that it, it extends much farther than that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just happy that that's all one place. I thought I was gonna have to yeah. keep going back to the Japanese American National Museum and having 
you know, conversation. You will, because those yeah. are, so the book that we're talking about is called Hidden in Plain Sight, Selected Writings of Karen Higa, and it's just, it's available now. Um, and the, the book has essays by Karen, but they're not her full publications. So you will have to go back to Janet. Um, but please go, thank you for that. <laughs> please go ahead. Well, I guess I, I sort of mentioned in my um, notes, but um, you know, Karen's work was originally, when I had met her and encountered her, it was, I had, thought that it was more, you know, emerged out of multiculturalism and then, you know, Japanese American incarceration and that history, which was much, I mean, but, but meeting her and I realized that there was so much more. And I think that that kind of diversity of interest and also just the scope and acuity of her um, thinking was um, transformational for me. Um, I, 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 didn't have too many mentors. Um, I always felt like I was, you know, the, in, in terms of the of going through graduate school, and um, there's a lot of models theoretically, but they're mostly um, within the trajectory of of either, you know, nationalist national kind of models of of you know um, Japanese history or Japanese American history or. Eurocentric history, you know, it's, it's not, there isn't a real kind of flexibility of, um, I think, creative thinking in, in terms of these different fields. And so um, I hope that um, she will affect and impact a more, I guess, creative approach to, you know, these kind of transnational histories as well. I think the biggest thing that we've we've been working on with these panels is the way that Karen was so involved in art and art history, but also with organizing and community, and the way that those um, are just inseparable and entwined. And um, she, in my own practice, just reminds me when I think of her, I, I'm reminded I, I have a deep studio practice that I maintain, but also to be outside in the world um, with people, working together on things with people, um, that's very important. I think for me, um, I think for me, one of the things Going back to the, the theme of acceptance, it really was um, invaluable for me because I think um, I learned very early on, I think I was, it was at the age of seven, I started writing letters on a giant metal typewriter and my dad would pace back and forth and he would have me write letters to his labor union. Um, because um, his coworkers were constantly um, leveling complaints to try to get my dad fired. And that was my first, those were my first experiences with discrimination. I was seven um, and I had better English skills than my dad. So that's how I learned how to type. It was like the, the typewriter was like this big. No. Um, so I, I learned very early on that you don't always get to choose your entanglements. Sometimes your entanglements choose you. And when I went, when I was studying art history, my parents had no idea what I was studying, just that I was at college and they were happy that I was at college because neither of them went. You know, when my, my dad was here illegally and my mom got here as a teenager having finished junior high, and the moment she got here having left Burma where there were anti-Chinese riots, she got here and started working at sweatshops. She didn't even go to high school. So the fact that I was in college, I was a good girl. I was a good Chinese daughter. <laughs> um, so, but they didn't realize that when I went away to college that I was studying art history to learn about our culture and our history because they wouldn't tell me anything. 
they couldn't tell me anything. And there was a lot of shame there and there was pain. They faced a lot of discrimination. They were poor, so they couldn't travel back and forth and visit family. Um, and so my art history education was really about coming to terms with this, you know, what they gave me, and also all the things that they could never tell me or articulate. Um, so finding a role model like Karen was, for me, um, you know, giving voice to that silence and replacing shame with pride and cultivating trust in a community that I needed in order to learn about myself, you know, context. And for me, um, doing work in the community has been incredibly empowering. Um, and I will say that as I go forward and think about Karen's legacy and how I will continue to advance it in my own practice, um, I, I have to admit that people have reached out to me and asked me to mentor them. And because I've dealt with my own lack of self-acceptance, I just ghosted them. <laughs> it's like, I don't have anything to teach you. I'm not successful. But the truth is, like I said, community takes, community requires everyone's participation, no matter how accomplished or how wealthy or how intelligent or how esteemed. Um, and so that's something that I will commit to going forward um, when I think about Karen and her acceptance of me. Um, what are things that what are um, things that Karen gave you that she taught you? It sounds like she helped you find opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, she was, Opening she was doors. Very, yeah, she was very supportive. Like, it was kind of un, very surprising how most um, unconditionally supportive she was. Um, even though I didn't know her, like we weren't super close in the beginning, you know, um, mm -hmm. and when I first met her um, through the early days of being in Los Angeles, um, I think because there were very few, perhaps, you know, um, I mean, I'm Japanese American, but I'm working on, I, my specialization is, work, is um, art from Japan, and I think that that but that was where we differed. Is that you know she was she was mostly focused on the um, on the work here, and I think that 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 difference was very much an interest for both you know like reciprocally you know learning about each other. So um, yeah, I think that that's that that difference is also something that um, fascinated. Um, me and also just in key points of my life, um, you know, seeing the Bruce Yonemoto um, retrospective or survey in 99 and then prompting me to apply, you know, and learn. It just, there were this, these, it was, I didn't think about it until I think I was preparing for this panel that, you know, it was really interesting to see that there, that she was so critical. Um, yeah, and jumping me to where I am now. Yeah, that, that's interesting, made me think that she's somebody who is a role model that I didn't even realize she was a role model when she was in my life, but really from doing this work of um, preparing for this talk, I realized how much um, she gave me and others, but I mean, the simple answer is um, my, fir uh, my first institutional shows, two of them were um, through her, so sh uh, that is a very real thing. And then also organizing right now with AAPIAN, I've been looking a lot at Godzilla and the organizing that she did with that group, and um, it's really inspiring 
Um, and it was seemed like it was really fun. Like the Godzilla book, which also just came out, um, has is basically a lot of primary source material, flyers and newsletters and photographs. And like everybody looks like they're having a blast. And I think that's a really great strategy um, that attracts other people. So if we want to expand our scope and exp and grow our group, it should be. Um, it, it's it's work, but it's work together that's fun. And um, she talks about in her writing on Godzilla that um, a, a year into the meetings, which were in different people's apartments in New York, um, there was kind of like a cachet around going to these meetings. And so they grew and grew. And then, then they were uh, at the Clock Tower Gallery. And then they, they were at Artist Space. And there was like standing room only at the meetings. So it's about um, generating energy. She's good at that, you know, she's really good at that. Thank you so much. I think this is a good time, unless you guys have any questions or topics that you wanna address. I think this might be a great time to open it up to audience questions or comments. Hi, thanks so much. I really appreciate all of every, each of you, uh, your presence here. So what is, um, what's, what will AAPI uh, AN be doing? Like, what are your plans? I mean, that's really exciting for me, in, especially in light of everything that you've said up here, that, that there is some momentum going forward for something new. So what will that be? Um. We're a pretty, we're kind of a, a large group and kind of, um, I'm gonna, it, I'm thinking about Godzilla again and they were saying like, if you show up to the meeting, you're in. Um, and I think AAPIAN has operated that way. Like if you want to participate, you just click on the Zoom and then you're just in. Um, and so there, there's, it's a broad group that is a little bit organized and then so what we've done is we've broken off into little um, subgroups where we take on a thing. So I, I was part of like the Karen Higa panel subgroup. There's an, another subgroup that's working on an anthology of Asian American art. Um, and there's another subgroup that's working on a retreat where we will go away um, and, I, and, and um, have more um, like focused discussion. Um, I really feel that it's, for me, AAPIAN has been like that thing where like you just showing up at the gym, like if you just show up, things start to happen. And um, just meeting has made many things happen. Like I'm uh, involved in um, a, a, a collaborative work with somebody else who's here, A. Arakawa, we're working on a performance where we're performing being an, an academic, which is <laughs> gonna be ridiculous. <laughs> um, so things are just, ha you know, it's just from the practice of meeting. So there's a discord, we can, well, we can uh, you can look at it. A after I'll tell you the link. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the great presentations. Um, this isn't, I, I don't have a, you know, very well formulated question, but um, particularly Anna, as you were speaking about Godzilla, um, it reminded me of the, the context in which Godzilla formed, you know, um, coming, out, coming from what was the culture wars in a very divisive society in the U.S. Um, in the 80s and coming into the 90s. And I find it very interesting that we're at a moment where we're having to make these networks, these groups once again. And I wonder if you can talk a bit about that because I think it says something um, quite resonant about um, the context in which we're living 
and how that forms, I think, um, maybe the question is how that forms your own practices as artists and as curators and as art historians. Um, what is what is the, the, the kind of struggle, it's too strong of a word, but what, perhaps it is the right word, what is the struggle now um, that you think is, differentiates from, say, what Godzilla was doing um, in the 90s? I think I could speak to that, or I have an answer for myself. Um, for me, the struggle is invisibility. It's been invisibility for a long time. I mean, I think, I think it's really wonderful that we're all here together and that people showed up. I actually had a nightmare that no one would show up <laughs> and that the lights didn't come on and the museum staff weren't here. And that was, um, but I think, I think it's great that, that we're all here together and that, that there have been tragic reasons for us to mobilize, um, but then we're here. Um, but for me, you know, when I started working on Asian American art exhibitions in 1997, um, the struggle then was invisibility, and it remains invisibility. Um, and somebody, you know, I, I have this alternative art gallery. I don't pay rent, the space is gifted to me. Um, you know, someone from my past who supported my work at the Chinese American Museum decided to support me by giving me a beautiful space and historic building in New Chinatown. And I knew exactly what I was gonna do with it. I was gonna make it a showcase for Asian American artists. It doesn't matter that I don't have any money, I can use my sweat equity to make it happen. So every time I put out an exhibition, it chips away at our invisibility as a community. Um, and so for me, invisibility has always been an issue whether there's been API hate and violence incidents taking place around the country because for me, invisibility has been part of my, you know, something that I've been working against for a very long time. It's been part of my personal mission, you know. Um, a friend of mine told me, I think you should make Art Salon Chinatown inclusive for artists of all backgrounds. And I said, no way. There aren't enough spaces for us in the arts. And until there are, my, my little gallery that's Asian American for, by, and about has a purpose and is relevant and has a need. So that's my answer. Well, I guess the question is between, basically it's been 20 years, 30 years. Um, yeah, I think the context is, it is strange how there's so much um, that has happened between then and now, but also, but at the same time, not much has changed. Um, I think, you know, I was still an under, undergrad at the time when, um, I mean, actually even before, you know, when um, I was reading all of the multiculturalism, you know, the, the theory that was coming out from, and trying to incorporate that into um, my, research on Japanese, you know, this, the, the cultural construct, or even just the, you know, what is national, what is um, national identity? What is um, an American identity that is, happens to, you know, have Asian descent? And of course, there's so many, um, it's, it's, even that questioning is, um, to me, I think I was struggling because my, as I mentioned, I was in between these two worlds of, you know, native coming from Japan and then of course here being amongst a lot of the Japanese American community who didn't, a lot of them didn't speak um, Japanese. And so um, I think that that, for me, from my perspective, um, the times have, I, get, I think economically is basically, you know, it's just, there's a lot of shift that happened um, 
then in terms of the depression, the um, cultural, you know, um, depression of the late um, well, recession, um, and and then the inflation that com came up in you know the 2000 up until 2008, and I feel like those. Um, global shifts have also affected the way that some of the um, some of the Asian um, artists, as well as exhibitions, have come to the fore through museum work. Um, and you know, there were certain moments, I think, but um, like in the 2010s, I think there were a lot of shows about um, Asian art um, that were coming to the fore finally because there was a generation of us and you know a Arakan as well but um, who were out of grad school you know finally becoming professionals and being able to actually contextualize and translate a lot of these works um, and a lot of these you know the the kind of sensi sensibilities that weren't translatable um, and you know there's so lumping together Asian art, I don't know, Asian American, it, Japanese, Japanese American, I mean, these, there needs to be a, 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 a subtle kind of complexity of understanding that, um, again, Karen, I think her work was very um, inspirational in terms of the subtleties and not just within the which Asian, but, you know, beyond and being on, be able to identify the kind of, you know, the marginal. Um, so I guess it's more just there's, you know, I'm, I'm, there is there are active, you know, um, the Godzilla group. I think they're amazing, and um, it's great that this history is finally being more formalized with, you know, Howie Chen's book. But um, yeah, I think that that's the difference. I don't know. Maybe that didn't really answer so much of your question, but there is this, you know, generational difference that I think. Um, we're still struggling. There, not much has changed, but a lot has changed. Um, and I think there are more people who can contextualize, but um, yeah, the art, the art world is different too, so. This has been really uh, a wonderful um, presentation. And I must say, I caught myself by surprise when I saw the, um, the title of the panel of the writings for Manzanar. And for the longest time, I thought exclusively in terms of, of Japanese internment. But just a few nights ago, I watched on PBS a wonderful documentary that referenced the indigenous that were you know, coming back to the place that they had been asked to leave. And I'm wondering if either someone knows of her writings, if she ever made reference to that, or if not, what you think she might say in terms of how we consider um, the cultural construct, that if we're being, you know, in terms of visibility, it seems of the identity po politics of the 90s, they were one group that was at very few tables. And so I'm just, you know, what, what, are we, what are we being called to do today? What would she kind of tap us on the shoulder to consider? Or did she ever put it in her writings? I'm immensely curious. I, I don't know if it was in her writings, but I can speak. A, I, I just went to the um, Post and Pilgrimage, um, and it was done in collaboration um, with the community there. So there is a, um, a layered conversation. And even within the museum there, um, they include an exhibit on uh, Post and, and the time of the camp. So it's, it's a much longer conversation. And again, I can't speak to. Um, if it was in her writings, because like I said, I've got a lot of reading to do and I have not made, I just got this book like two weeks ago. Um, but, um, but it is a part of the contemporary conversation. Oh, Russell, yes. Well, I, I should maybe just mention that um, when Karen was in the independent studies program in New York, they, she organized an exhibition which is part of what they do in that program. And the theme of the exhibition was loosely around tourism, but it uh, featured very prominently both uh, Jimmy Durham and James Luna, um, uh, indigenous Native American artists, who uh, um, were very prominent in that show, kind of right at, which was, I think, the very first exhibition she ever organized. And she did with, with Pamela Lee. And so.
Sorry, we are running out of time, so we have time for two more questions. Thanks, Claudia. Well, first of all, I want to say I'm full of admiration for AAPIAN, and I think um, it's amazing. I kind of want to play the academic for a second, because yeah, we're at UCLA. Um, so, uh, you know, in a way, I, I think that uh, because I was at Godzilla meetings, and I knew Karen because I was a year before her at uh, the <laughs> ISP, <laughs> and I saw the show that she did with Pam, and of course I also know her here. And I think, you know, Mika's completely right in that the breadth of Karen's work is really astounding. I just want to put into dialogue several ideas that have been uh, put in circulation. The first being, how would, you know, what was the difference between Godzilla and now? So I think one has to think a little bit about New York in uh, the early 90s, in that uh, ACT UP started in 1987. Um, WAC, which was one of the projects of the director here, Annie Philbin, started in, I think, 19. 92-ish. I was a direct beneficiary of Godzilla in the sense that because there were no Asian American artists in 1991, uh, Godzilla met. I went to a couple of meetings. I wasn't a part of the group. But then, you know, I, I, I feel that my being in the 93 Whitney Biney was a direct result of that. Because there were none in 91. That's right. So I want to just put into dialogue this idea of visibility versus the idea of hidden in plain sight. In the sense that I think Kelly's example of that which is on the ground before you, that is speaking, you know, not anything coherent, but it's actually dying to speak, that I think portrays, for me at least, not just that we are here and hidden in plain sight. But then there's also a desire to reveal. And that desire to reveal is, in a sense, the secret. The secret is not information. The secret is that which you desperately want to reveal but cannot reveal. And therefore, I want to, in a sense, put this idea of what is different now to uh, in dialogue with what was different, you know, what, what was happening in 1992, 93, right? So, yes, visibility, invisibility is really, really important. But I think that what we're trying to reveal desperately is our love for one another. <laughs> and I mean, that is really basically the secret, right? And there is actually no information there, there's no content there except if we were to go back to the origins of Asian American studies, if you were to think back to 1968, 1969, you will remember that the, the term that was used then was not people of color. It was third world people. So I would just simply like to propose that we keep that in mind, that the secret intimacy between colonized people all over the world, including the indigenous, is really the precious thing that we, I think, um, can express a little bit differently than something like the solidity of an identity. Once upon a time, uh, assimilated into an identity, <laughs> something solid called Asian American, we have this identity to use however we want, right? So I want to remember 1968, 1969. I want to remember 1992, but also what we can do with it now. Yeah, that is so beautiful. That's very beautiful, Simon. Thank you. Thank you for this panel. Um, this might be more of a comment than a question. I'm still formulating my head, and it sort of um, riffs on what Simon just said. But um, many people in this room were up at Stanford a few weeks ago for the Asian American Arts Initiative Cantor Museum 
symposium, Patty spoke, um, I spoke, a number, I think a couple of other people in the room spoke. And one of the things that came up after this two-day conference was the kind of incredible elusiveness, responsibility, um, vastness, slipperiness, complexity of, of what it means, what Asian America, what being Asian American means today. And I think, you know, just remembering, I'm, I'm, all these memories of Karen are, are coming back and, um, and one of the things that came up was also the kind of the feeling, the feeling, the emotionality. And I think that the kind of practice, having the, the combination or the sort of balance um, and the duality or more than just duality, but of a, of a rigor, of an academic, of a, of a real practice, but then also, as Anna was saying before, um, intensely involved in kind of outward, the community. Um, but also, then back to what you were saying, Simon, around love and having a kind of emotional, feelings-oriented lead to the work that deals with both the self and the community and, you know, identity therein and, you know, expansive is something that, um, you know, I can't, it's, it's difficult to say, but that, that has this kind of resonance of Karen in the way that she existed as a friend, a mentor, an academic, a curator, a thinker, you know, in all of these capacities that she sort of embodied and it sort of came up in these, in this sort of thinking about this symposium, which I think someone called the closest we get to a loophole of retreat as, America, as Asian Americans. Thank you. Claudia's saying we got to wrap it up. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.